Hello, my name is Daniel Schoonmaker. I'm the Executive Director of West Michigan Salem Business Forum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our presentation today. For those that are not familiar with our organization, the Forum is a collaboration of business institutions dedicated to promoting sustainable business practices with a focus on climate leadership, social justice, circular economy, and community resilience. This is the seventh in our series of online discussions on how the coronavirus pandemic is impacting sustainability and sustainable business. Upcoming programs include next 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 week still a deep a deep a deep a deep dive on resilience of farms during and after covid-19 uh looking it look it look it looking particularly on the, on the uh, uh those being packed on the lakeshore which will include Lori Lundell of Lundell Farms Michaela Rowden of McLaughlin Grows Urban Farms at Community and Compass and Amanda Shreve of Michigan Farmers Market Association Then later in the month, we'll be it will it will be it will uh, will will be featuring a forum with our Michigan's Great Southwest Sustainable Business, Business Forum group in the uh, Southwest Michigan on advancing social equity and sustain sustainability, which will feature Lynn Todman of Spectrum Health Lakeland at the City of St. Joseph, Laura Goose of City of St. Joseph and Whirlpool, and Mary Jo Schnell of Out Center of Southwest Michigan. I'd also like it, like it, like it, like it, like to, I'd like to highlight our upcoming uh, triple bottom line batch, which is our annual uh, annual fundraiser on Wednesday, October fourteenth. Uh, please save the please save the, uh, the save, uh, save save the date for that. Just, uh, we will be selling the uh, the the fifty point five fifty point fifth uh, uh, anniversary of Earth Day at that time. Videos of today's program and the prior, se prior sessions are available on demand at no cost. You'll find a link to those in the chat shortly that you may that you may like to bookmark. You'll also receive a link to, uh, link to those with a to, uh, to to that with a feedback survey and any additional notes that may come out of today's program. This series and all of our programs are primarily funded through membership donations. If you are not a member of our organization, I encourage you to become one. Uh, there has never been a better time to do so, and or honestly, a greater need. To that effect, I'd like to welcome our newest corporate member, Finite Phoenix. You may also be interested in learning about our various working groups, including our Climate Leadership Roundtable, our Equity and Sustainability Working Group, and our new Prosperous Economy Working Group, all of, me all of which have meetings schedule, schedule, uh, schedule in the next few weeks. Uh, and finally, as one last bookkeeping item, uh, if you are part of a part of our organization have, and uh, are or are, are, are furloughed, uh, uh, furloughed in the coming weeks, uh, please do reach out to us if you'd like to stay involved. Uh, current, Current, uh, current empl empl employment is not nece necess necessarily a, cri a criteria for participation, uh, and and we uh, we do we do appreciate your support and hope to find ways to support you during these times as well. Uh, now I'd like to introduce my colleague Rose Spickler, membership manager for West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, who will be mon moderating our panel uh, program today, promoting employee wellness and community sustainability through food systems among COVID nineteen and beyond. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're very, very glad to have you here. Um, we're very excited about this program today. Um, I'd like to first introduce our panel and then head right into some questions and answers. Um, so uh, first up, we have um, Kate Lido, uh, who is the Director of Marketing for Experience Grand Rapids, Lisa Oliver King, who is the Executive Director of Our Kitchen Table, and Garrett Ziegler, who is the Community Food Systems Educator for Michigan State University Extension. Um, so, if we could um, just have all of you just give a brief introduction um, of yourselves and uh, so we can welcome you. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, please note um, before we do begin that you can share your thoughts with the panelists or all attendees through the chat function on Zoom. You can also ask questions through the question and answer field. Um, so before we get underway with all of the questions, would you mind introducing yourselves and what brings you to our roundtable today? Uh, we can start with you, Kate. Great, good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Kate Lido. I'm the Director of Marketing as Experience Grand Rapids. Um, some may not be familiar with Experience Grand Rapids and we are the Convention and Visitor Bureau for all of Kent County. So we focus all on tourism in the area. Um, usually our main goal is to drive tourism to our region. Um, but right now, of course, that looks a little bit different as um, everyone's jobs are looking a bit different right now. 
So right now we're really focusing on helping our local businesses promote what they can. So um, I'll be talking a little bit more about restaurants today specifically, but the um, shift with the executive order to take out and curbside delivery, um, curbside and delivery, and how that's um, evolved and changed and how important it is to support them locally. So that's a little bit um, about me. I've been with Experience Grand Rapids about eight years and um, have lived in the Grand Rapids area for um, just over 10. So excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa. Hello, everyone, and um, thank you for um, inviting me to be a part of this webinar and to be with the guests that you have um, on the panel. Uh, my name is Lisa Oliver King. I started an organization called Our Kitchen Table. Uh, we are a food justice organization, and we use the strategy of helping families and schools grow their own food. Uh, we provide those families and um, schools with food garden coaches and cooking coaches to um, help them grow and harvest, as well as do meal planning and preparation. Um, our kitchen table has been around for about since 2005. We received our first big grant in um, 2010. We are currently working with the Grand Rapids Public Schools, primarily at um, one school location, Martin Luther King Junior Leadership Academy. Um, working primarily with um, pre-K through first grade and the uh, student council, which is made up of middle schoolers, um, helping them to grow a school garden, as well as um, helping families to grow their own garden. They grow uh, between 175 to 225 pounds of food. Um, our first year families have a container garden system. Our second year families go to container garden and a raised bed system. Um, we also um, support a small base farmer's market called the Southeast Area Farmer's Market that we um, run out of Martin Luther King Park. Um, this year we are doing a collaboration around the market also at Baxter Community Center. We um, do several workshops. We have a registered dietitian that works with us. And um, this year we will be bringing on a dental hygienist at the request of the parents um, to also um, work with us. Um, just like Kate mentioned, the world is different um, now that we are dealing with COVID-19. Uh, we are fortunate enough that uh, we started our food growing program last week. Um, the food garden coaches that delivered the plants and the soil um, were dressed like they were in hazmat and we're not used to that because it's all about the connection, but we understand we need to connect in a different way. So we delivered plants and soil and compost um, to our families and to the school. And then we are doing um, remote teaching. So parents are taking their iPads and laptops outside and we are guiding them through the planting process. And um, they connect with us on a daily basis about watering practices. And uh, so far, regardless of the cold weather, parents planted their plants and they are watering and um, things are all good. And so we will be doing um, uh, cooking demonstrations. Not only do we do, not only do we show families how to plant, but we also do cooking demonstrations. Um, we will be doing cooking demonstrations through Facebook Live, I believe. I've never done it, so um, I've only participated in it. And so OKT will be doing that. And then um, we, um, with our registered dietitian, she is doing nutrition education through Zoom with our families. And we are figuring out how we can also do virtual grocery store tours because it's important for us to understand um, how to read food labels and ingredients and things like that. So that's what our kitchen table is doing. Wonderful, thank you very much. And Garrett. Thanks, Rose and, and Dan, for uh, this opportunity to join the webinar today. Um, my name is Garrett Ziegler, as Rose said, and I work for Michigan State University Extension as a community food systems educator. Um, what that means is I do a lot of different work um, that is, is mostly focused on helping people, um, local people in West Michigan, um, access and eat uh, food that is produced um, by local producers here in West Michigan. Um, so I work on everything from 
working with very small farmers that might be selling at farmers markets or through community supported agriculture programs, kind of helping them um, market their, uh, their products to new customers, um, collaborate with each other and, and develop local farm networks. Um, as, and then from there all the way up to um, helping schools, hospitals, um, larger institutions, like many of the um, members of the Sustainable Business Forum, um, source food for their cafeterias and food service operations um, from local farmers, working with supply chain partners kind of all across that um, local food supply chain value chain. Um, and yeah, that was really the focus of my work uh, pre, pre-COVID um, and, and post-COVID. There's, there's been a lot of things that have kind of shifted and changed. And um, for the last month and a half, I've really been focused on just kind of assisting um, farmers, um, helping them understand how they can safely uh, sell food and, and still, you know, have, have food to sell for their customers. So a lot of it's been kind of how they're setting up their um, drop-offs and pickups or how they're selling at farmers markets to ensure that their employees are safe. Um, I also do a lot of work with um, farm markets and agritourism, agritainment ventures. Um, so helping those um, people, the people that do you pick operations, things like that, kind of helping them think through what that looks like um, from a social distancing standpoint and all kinds of different stuff. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. Um, so we'll dive right in. Uh, there have been a lot of talks about how local organizations can help promote health and wellness for their employees recently, um, and the importance of our food system in both personal health and community resiliency. Um, there were discussions about these topics before the coronavirus pandemic, and they're even more prevalent now. So to kick off the conversation today, um, can you all share some thoughts on the sustainability and resilience of the food system and the food economy pre-COVID-19? Uh, Lisa, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Rose. Um, uh, so I think we need to be realistic. The food system is not stable and it's not resilient. And we've seen evidence of that before the COVID virus. Um, if there's a drought, our food system is impacted. Um, there are multiple examples, and I'm sorry, I'm only able to think of the drought and COVID-19 in terms of what do we see on the news? The um, Tyson saying, here's what's going to happen in the grocery store. You're not going to have meat, basically. Um, dairy farmers are dumping milk because they can't get it out. Anything can, the, the food system is broken and anything can stop it and bring it to a halt, which means our prices go up, uh, availability is less. So to say that the food system is stable and resilient um, it's not. And so um, from our kitchen table perspective, that's why it's so important to support people like um, Garrett in terms of supporting farmers and supporting the local economy and um, figuring out how we can support our local food businesses because when we look at things on a global level or a national level, um, it just doesn't exist in terms of sustainability and resiliency. Um, the food economy, Garrett probably can speak to that um, better than I can, but the reality is um, I believe in Grand Rapids and in Michigan and in our nation, we had a robust um, food economy. But again, all it takes is one thing to put things to a halt and um, that's not available. Now that doesn't necessarily translate into how workers have been treated. Um, um, uh, when we look at the prevalence around social determinants of health, communities of color are at the highest of that. Um, when we look at the impact on food, communities of color um, are hit pat, impact harder um, than what we've seen with other communities. So uh, I'm going to stop there, but um, like I said, there is no such thing as a stable food system. There is no such thing as resiliency. Uh, resiliency is about us learning what we need to do to uh, make things happen and coming to and connecting together as a community and supporting our local economy. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Garrett, would you like to take it from there? Yeah, I can I can um, mention a couple things. Yeah, I think in terms of resiliency, um, again, to, to echo Lisa's point, the, the food system 
operates and um i don't think you know we're we're not necessarily because of covid going to see you know we've seen limited supplies at some grocery stores we're not going to see a complete breakdown of you know our national and global food system um but i think it definitely has shined a light on on some of the issues that do exist um in in how we maybe could move towards more of a localized food system and a localized supply chain um, to build in some more of that resiliency. Um, I will say that while the food system itself um, hasn't always been maybe considered a, a like something that is resilient or, um, you know, because it's such a large multinational global system, um, local farmers are I, what I would consider some of the most resilient and sustainable people um, and have shown that through this through, through the impacts and how they've kind of addressed, um, you know, shifted their business. I mean, that we've seen far local farmers put, build online stores like overnight, you know, in a matter of, of hours to, to real understand that they, their um, traditional ways of selling food might not be possible right now. Um, so they're pivoting their business models. They're addressing, how can I still sell my products to customers? How can I make sure I'm doing it in a safe way that, um, you know, ensures the safety of my customer and myself and my employees. So, um, especially small local growers that, you know, are, are used to selling direct to consumer. Um, I think they're, they've really shown the resiliency through this by um, actually not, I don't want to call it a silver lining, but um, I mean, we've seen the growth for a lot of small farmers that have, have been able to, um, you know, develop those online marketplaces, been able to, you know, create some new ways to distribute their food to local people. Um, we've seen them really be, doing well over the past month and a half. Um, we talked about community support agriculture. Um, we're seeing a lot of farms increase the number of shares they have available because they're starting to sell out. Um, for the last couple of years leading up to this, there had been kind of a worry that that CSA model had been kind of on a decline, that shares had been um, plateauing for local farmers and some farmers were even um, you know, moving away from that model because they didn't, they weren't able to, to move as much product or sell as much product as they were looking to through it. So um, I saw one article um, through Yelp, which is kind of a random uh, source for this, but they, they said they had some kind of listing of economic impact on different um, areas of the, of the economy um, and, and had singled out uh, CSAs as having 579% growth um, since the middle of March. Uh, which is kind of astounding. And that was only one of two industries that had seen any growth um, according to their kind of economic, you know, looking at restaurants and taking all that sort of different thing. So um, yeah, I would say from a resiliency standpoint, local farmers have really been showing, um, you know, how innovative and how resilient they can be in the face of crisis for sure. Thank you. Uh, Kate, what are your thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, well, I speak from the tourism perspective. So kind of up the supply chain of the food system and um, really promoting the restaurants. And I would say pre-COVID, we were seeing um, record growth for restaurants. We were, um, you know, everybody in Grand Rapids was hearing of new restaurants opening all of the time. We keep track of all of that on our website, experienceyard.com. So just um, tracking, you know, new restaurants opening, creative type restaurants. Um, we were really using the food and dining scene to attract new tourists to the Grand Rapids area as a main attractor because it is, I'll say is, because I do believe it will come back um, stronger than ever, but it is so strong here. And, um, you know, maybe as Lisa spoke about down that supply chain, things are broken, it's not sustainable, um, but the restaurant owners were really getting creative and they are really making it work on um, that restaurant and tourism level. So um, going forward, you know, we're seeing a lot similar to what Garrett talked about with the farmers of, um, we saw restaurants kind of pop up brand new um, ways of doing business overnight when these government order came out. So um, they really got creative. They, I would say resilient is um, a perfect word to describe those restaurant owners that are really making it work. Um, even the ones that have closed for hopefully a temporary time right now, um, I think they're going to be resilient in coming back. And I think that just the things that we've seen with um, the offering curbside and, you know, pull right up and they have a whole new business model, um, restaurants that created delivery overnight, things like that. Um, it's really, it's been interesting to watch, but really um, makes me hopeful that, you know, they are creative enough and resilient enough to make it work even in this hard time. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Uh, so the coronavirus pandemic and its containment strategies have certainly highlighted the importance of food systems to personal health and community resiliency, as some of you mentioned. Um, food security and nutrition have become increasingly visible concerns as restaurant closures, grocery shortages, and emergency food distributions came to represent the pandemic's economic and social impacts. Um, so it's quickly becoming one of the key measures of resilience for Michigan communities and their workers. Um, how can local organizations support their workers and communities through investments in food systems? Um, we'll start at the beginning of the food system. Garrett, why don't you kick us off with that one? Sure. So, um, yeah, I think the answer, the question of how local organizations can support um, local food systems, you know, has kind of a pre-COVID answer and a post-COVID answer. Um, so in kind of like, you know, I've, we've had discussions, Rose and, and Dan and others um, in the Sustainable Business Forum about, you know, really trying to highlight things like worksite CSAs. So um, that's a program where a business um, would basically work with a local farmer to um, either have a drop off of community spire holder shares at a work site. Um, so it allows the farmer to access, you know, a large number of people at a single place um, where they could then, you know, sell CSA shares there without having to necessarily, you know, do put a lot of legwork into the marketing of those CSA shares to that employer. Um, rather the employer would kind of internally market and get their employees on board. Um, and we've seen programs where, uh, you know, we mentioned wellness as part of this. So we've seen programs where, um, work sites or employers, large employers, um, the University of Kentucky, for example, um, they've actually incentivized the, the sale of these CSA shares for their employees by offering, um, you know, subsidized shares. So the, the University of Kentucky would, would put up anywhere from $100 to $200 per CSA share for an employee um, to be able to, you know, offset some of that cost for their employees. So uh, I think Last I heard, um, you know, that's been a program that they've been ramping up over the years, but this past year they were offering that to any employee within the University of Kentucky system that wanted to purchase a CSA share where they could have um, that offset. Um, and they've actually done a lot of research looking at from a wellness standpoint and a cost saving standpoint, okay, you know, the theory is that by purchasing a CSA share, by purchasing from a local farmer, you're, you're buying healthier food for your employees, your employees are eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, but how does that actually translate into healthcare costs? Because that's really the root of what you're trying to do, create healthier employees, you know, reduces your um, healthcare costs as an employer. Um, and University of Kentucky did some research actually looking at um, their expenditure, their employees' expenditures, you know, doctor's visits related to um, diet-related diseases, um, prescription prices, prescription, co prescription costs related to those same things. Um, and they saw for every dollar they invested in, in helping their employees purchase those CSA shares, um, they had a, a $3 return on investment and a reduction of healthcare costs. Um, and that's over like a one to two year period. So those were immediate reductions that they were seeing, not, you know, not to mention the longer term impacts and those reduced healthcare costs due to a, a healthier diet and, and those types of wellness activities. Um, so that's just you know, one example of a way that um, a, a company, an employer, um, can really, you know, invest not only in their local food system, but also in their employers, you know, health and wellness. Um, obviously, with the COVID, with the pandemic, with everything that's happening, uh, with people working from home, a lot of work sites not even, you know, operating, um, and, and also, you know, a lot of businesses um, taking hits financially, um, that may not be necessarily as feasible. Um, but I think, you know, we can still Employees can, employers can still encourage their um, employees to invest in, in the local food, can still, um, you know, so we have an event coming up tomorrow that we're hosting that's a, a statewide virtual CSA open house uh, fair event. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, it's on the call today, um, maybe we can share that out and they can push that out to their employees through internal um, communication. So um, there's lots of ways I think that you can invest um, in the local food system. And then, like I mentioned before, I work with, um, institutions that might have institutional food service operations where they have cafeterias or, you know, kind of smaller retail um, food service outlets as part of their um, corporate campuses. Um, those, those sorts of operations, uh, once, you know, we get back and hopefully at some point back into the swing of things and, and people going to the work site, um, you know, those sorts of operations can support local food by, by purchasing from local farmers for those food service operations. It's a really key way, um, you know, you think about local schools, local hospitals, um, large corporate campuses are feeding thousands of people a day um, that, you know, if they're utilizing more local food into those food service operations, that can really, really have a big impact on um, local farmers, local businesses that are helping distribute and process that food. 
um, and then also local workers. Perfect. Um, Kate, uh, maybe another way that local organizations can support their workers and communities through investments in the food systems? Yeah, well, again, you know, on the restaurant side, um, just to put a little bit of perspective, the as everyone knows, the situation is dire. I've got some stats in front of me from the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association. Um, just the first 22 days of March, the restaurant industry lost an estimated $491 million in sales in the state. Uh, more than 72,000 jobs were lost, and we know that that has grown in the past month since those stats came out. So anything that people can do to help support um, the restaurants. I think I've seen a couple of um, businesses that have really taken to um, supporting their their employees by getting them gift cards to different restaurants, or if they do have essential employees that are all working in one space, um, ordering, catering, um, anything, you know, one of those big orders in a day can really make a difference um, to those local restaurants in staying open, keeping their employees, and um, hopefully staying open long term as well. So that would be another um, suggestion. Lisa? Um, I think Garrett and Kate have really given some really good responses um, from an Our Kitchen Table perspective. Um, if businesses can, uh, we would encourage businesses to also help um, employees to grow their own food. And so if they can start small um, container gardens of growing their own greens and herbs, things that they can add to their cooking, um, that would be a positive um, supporting a local um, farmer's market, um, having employees to come together and, and adopt um, three farmer's markets or something here that they are going to support in some way. Um, I was just looking at um, the evening news last night and they had the mayor on from Atlanta um, and she was talking about strategies that they were using to support local um, businesses to stay home and they started um, a GoFundMe fund, or, or, or um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a fund to um, support those employees of those small businesses, businesses like restaurants, um, that um, could be shared with those um, employees to um, be able to sustain themselves uh, until we hopefully get on the other side of this virus. Um, hopefully um, sooner than later, um, but helping them to, um, you know, employers can come together, employees and employers can come together and um, support um, employees um, dealing in the food business with, you know, they need help with rent, they need help with food um, um, themselves, they need help with childcare. I, there are all kind of ways that we could be to supporting the local economy. Um, our kitchen table, we are, um, um, we've been fortunate enough where we have been able to distribute foods to families. And um, one way that we do that is that we provide them with a Visa gift card, something that they can use universally. And we say to them, um, if you, you can also use this card to support local businesses, um, local businesses in your neighborhood, um, local businesses um, here in Grand Rapids, um, keep that at the top of your list before you, um, which they can't use it for fast food, but before you go to something outside of your neighborhood. Let's think about those restaurants, those employees, and figure out how we can also make sure that the money stays in our neighborhood as opposed to being spent outside of the neighborhood. Um, but to add to Garrett and Kate's conversation, uh, we suggest, and we've gotten quite a few calls um, saying, can you help us grow our own food garden? And we say yes. And, um, you know, think about a salsa garden that you want to grow. But um, we would encourage people to also add the Awesome. Um, so building on that, um, how can local residents better support themselves and the community through their purchases and practices on top of the, um, the local organizations? Um, Garrett? Yeah, I would just say, you know, every, anything that we mentioned really about employees doing, um, local residents should be, can, can and should um, be supporting their local farmers. Um, 
CSA sales, again, I'll keep bringing that up. That's a large part of what I do. Um, I think that's the, the best way to really um, go about buying food from a local farmer. Um, for those not familiar with the CSA model, basically um, you oftentimes it's prepay, but a lot of CSA farms now do um, uh, monthly installment payments or things like that. But you basically prepay for or pre-sign up for a season's worth of um, whatever fresh fruits and vegetables that farm might have available um, throughout the season. So these are smaller diversified vegetable farms. Um, they're growing a wide variety of produce um, and they, the CSAs usually start the first week of June and run through end of October, or early November. So about 20 to 22 weeks. Um, and each week throughout the growing season, you'll get what's, what's fresh and available from that farm. Um, a lot of farms are doing uh, on-farm pickup um, for those CSA shares. Uh, sometimes they do uh, uh, pick up the, pickups at farmers markets or like we've said, local businesses or other kind of community organizations have oftentimes will work with the farmer to set up a pickup um, within communities. Um, we're also encouraging um, for folks that may not have, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have $500 or even $100 a month, um, let alone 500 up front to put towards a CSA share from a local farm. Um, so we're encouraging farmers as much as they can to look into accepting um, uh, bridge cards, um, SNAP benefits for those CSA shares. Um, there's a couple examples here in West Michigan that are done a really good job of, of working with um, local pantry organizations and food resource organizations as to, to use them as pickup points um, for folks for CSA shares and also accepting um, SNAP and double up food bucks for those CSA shares. Um, so CSA is a great way. Also, um, we have a great organization here in West Michigan called West Michigan Farm Link um, that uh, traditionally had certain kind of a food hub where they aggregate food from multiple different local farmers and suppliers um, and then kind of sell that or distribute that food out to local restaurants primarily. Um, and they had been slowly pivoting towards a more um, consumer focused uh, outlet for that food. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, kind of spurred that growth of theirs um, from the, from the um, direct consumer side. So pretty much anybody at this point can sign up to be a FarmLink member um, and you can access you know, hundreds of different local suppliers of fruits and vegetables, proteins, dairy, eggs, cheese, um, pretty much anything you can imagine, shelf stable products, pantry items, um, all from local businesses. And they'll, I've been shopping there the last couple of months. Um, we just, last week I just drove up, had my, had my order placed online, drove up on, on Tuesday afternoon, opened my tailgate of my car, they put it in and I drove away and it was as easy as that um, to, to get the freshest local stuff. So um, there's lots of ways for food people to continue to support local farmers individually. Um, and then as Lisa kind of talked about too, you know, growing your own food is, is a great way to take, take ownership of the food that you're eating and the food that you're putting in your body and kind of um, buck the, that global and national um, system that we've seen um, has kind of shown itself to be less resilient and less sustainable than local systems. Um, so definitely uh, thinking about growing your own garden this year, thinking about growing, maybe if you do grow your own garden, maybe growing a little more than what you might typically eat. And there's lots of great organizations that would accept that are, that are looking for more fresh produce for their, um, uh, you know, people that are accessing those food re resource um, resources. So that's a great way to, to support not only yourself, but also um, more folks in need in, the, in your community. Awesome. Kate or Lisa, would you like to add to that? Sorry, did you say Lisa? Either one of you, Kate or Lisa. Oh, go ahead, Kate. Sure. Um, I guess I haven't mentioned our website where we're um, curating all of the information about the restaurant. So I'll take this time to do that. It's supportrestaurantsgr.com. And I can put that in the chat too. Um, but what we're doing is tracking all of the restaurants that are open in some capacity right now. And that's a great way for the community to um, get involved, whether they're looking for, you know, takeout delivery, like I've talked about, or online gift cards. Um, we've also seen a lot of popularity with the um, alcohol carryout and the breweries that are delivering have been very popular. So that's all on supportrestaurantsgr.com. And then um, just looking through the chat too, I wanted to touch a little bit on, um, you know, the tourism just aspect as a whole and how this is going to be more of a longer term it's not going to be, you know, when the stay home order is up, tourism is going to go back to normal in the area. So we're going to have a lot less people in our region for a while. Um, right now, tourism is pretty much at a halt. And um, 
just for perspective last year, just conventions, not, you know, people coming here for fun, but just conventions alone. We hosted about 220 conventions in the Grand Rapids, um, just downtown. And that was about 170,000 attendees. Our um, research shows us that we've got about 7.6 million people that come overnight. So these are very large numbers. And I say that because um, it's really going to be falling on the locals to support these local businesses um, and try to kind of make up for all those people that aren't in town. And, um, you know, everybody, if they can just do their part as much as they can. I know a lot of people are um, laid off right now, furloughed, things like that. So it's hard to support as much as you'd like all the time. But um, just want to kind of point out that, you know, we usually have this large influx of tours in our area that are helping to support these local businesses too, that we're not going to see for a bit of time. Awesome. Lisa, kind of in a um, building on that, um, how local residents can better support themselves in the community, how can neighborhoods also become more resilient and connected through individual and neighborhood investments in food production? Um, building on Garrett and, and Kate, again, giving great responses. Um, what we've encouraged people to do, um, if there's some kind of way that they can grow with their neighbor, and then a neighbor ask another neighbor, um, as we say, if you grow a tomato plant, it doesn't just grow one tomato, it grows 30, so share. And um, folks have found in their neighborhood that people are growing tomato plants, but they're growing different type of tomatoes. And so some are growing tomatoes for sauces, some are growing tomatoes for hamburgers. So there's no such thing as a tomato is a tomato, if that gives an example. So um, we are encouraging folks to, um, reach out to their neighbors in some kind of way and share their food, grow together, share food, um, particularly identifying those families who may not otherwise tell you that they're struggling around food. Um, but if we find out what's going on in our, with our neighbors and in our neighborhoods, we can build what we call a collective. And um, we can stand together one for all and all for one. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. And so it's not just only you growing food, but it's also you growing food and sharing your food or expanding your neighborhood food system in some way. Um, with our kitchen table, we support, um, we host the Southeast Area Farmers Market. Um, with our Farmers Market, we have a bulk buying program. I'm sure Garrett probably can tell you about um, maybe some of those farmers who also may have a bulk buying program, but um, we bring families together and they buy in bulk. And um, then they divide that food up uh, in terms of dry goods and oils and um, juices for their kids that are low in sugar. Um, but being able to look at um, that together and again, thinking not only from a me perspective, how can I be resilient, but from a neighborhood perspective, how can we be resilient and um, doing things collectively. Um, our kitchen table, we have created a guide to replication which is um, a part of our website. So if anyone is interested in um, learning how to grow their own food, they are more than welcome to the guide. Um, our kitchen table, we are more than welcome to um, um, help anyone that is interested in growing, providing a food garden coach, giving some direction, particularly since we are learning now that we can achieve that um, virtually. Um, if they are interested in a CSA, like Garrett mentioned, um, please consider that um, um, not only do you need to, uh, can you support a CSA through cash, but if you have food subsidies such as SNAP and double food bucks, um, there are, um, you can use that around your CSA. Garrett, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, again, we've encouraged um, individuals and families to come together and um, if there is a local business in your neighborhood or five miles outside of your neighborhood, come together and support them in some kind of way. You know, have a, um, we are going to eat out day, um, one day a week. And not only can you do that individually, but you can also do that collectively, um, as well as if you can share. I know I have um, personally bought um, Visa gift cards and um, shared with um, folks um, just so they're able to also, it's not much, but it's, just want to show that I'm thinking about you. I care about what's going on and it, I hope that this can help in some kind of way. We can do that individually as well as a, in a collective way. 
All right, fantastic, thank you. Um, kind of uh, taking a turn, um, an interesting development during the COVID pandemic is the designation of food service workers as essential. Um, so two topics that have been brought up regarding this are the discrepancy between minimum wage and living wage, um, as well as the topic that um, undocumented farm workers have now been deemed essential, but still do not have the resources to protect themselves or their families during these times. Um, what efforts are you seeing that support a change in these disparities? Any, anybody who has a thought, maybe? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and I think it, you know, it, it just highlights the, the unsustainable nature of our, of our global national food system that we rely on um, you know, people that are not paid a living wage to um, grow our food, to pick our food, to process our food, to deliver our food, to prepare our food, and to serve our food. Um, so I think, you know, I think it really highlights that. Um, and I think that makes it all the more important that as, as we do continue to um, support local farmers and local businesses, we, we pay attention to um, what their growing practices are, what their employment practices are, are they? And, you know, a lot of farmers will, will talk about, you know, we, we do pay, you know, a living wage to our, our farm workers, or we do these things for our farm workers. Um, so beginning to think more strategically about, you know, the types of, of organizations you're, you're supporting, even from, you know, a local, it's great to support local businesses and local farmers. Um, and then if, if, you know, there's, there's ways to take that, take that a step further um, by, by looking at some of those labor practices and those sorts of things. Um, I would say, you know, um, a lot of those, those, those issues, those larger issues um, are policy issues. So, um, you know, ho hopefully this is, is highlighting, you um, more some of those disparities and encouraging people to um, look towards, you know, how are you using your voice when you vote? Um, what types of policies are leaders in, um, you know, looking at? Are they supporting a, a minimum, you know, a raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, those sorts of things? Um, you know, so those are just, just some examples of things to think about more broadly. Um, but yeah, think about how your, how your dollars are being spent and what, what your, your voting voice is, is supporting. This is Lisa. I would, um, I agree with um, Garrett. Um, um, Garrett said it all to me. Um, use your voice. Um, we are, um, let's see. Um, the reality is, is that they have become essential because they are needed to harvest farms. Um, and there's been um, little conversation about um, work conditions and uh, fair and living wage um, um, for those essential workers because they are essential. Um, like Garrett highlighted, um, but we also have an opportunity to, to use our voice and say to farmers that um, working conditions and pay what, um, how they are paid is important to us also. So I know that when I go to a restaurant, when I look, um, look to support a farm or even a farm stand, I ask those kind of questions. Tell me about the conditions, of course. They can tell me whatever, but at least I'm asking the question and I'm choosing how I spend my money um, and how I use my voice and um, raising the fact that if more people are asking questions, it will become clear that it is important to us and these are the things that we support. It's no different than going to a grocery store. My favorite grocery store is Harats. And when I go and I pick up a piece of fruit, I ask, is this seedless or not seedless? Because I don't eat things where seeds are supposed to be in them and they're not. So um, it's now I see Horrocks has more fruits with seeds in it. And I think that more people are asking for that instead of having a, a GMO piece of fruit. So uh, our voice is important. Um, the more that we raise those kind of questions, the more that the demand, um, it shows that there's a demand for um, fair um, practices to be happening uh, where we spend our dollars. Kate, how about in the uh, food service, the restaurant scene? Yeah, you know, it, as Garrett said, a lot of it is policy issues. So we really um, lean on and work with our partners over at the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association for those type of um, policy type um, questions. And uh, we partner with them and they do a great job of um, lobbying and working on those different policies. 
Um, I think what Garrett and Lisa both said applies for restaurants too. It's really asking the right questions, um, using your voice, and then when it comes time to vote, especially for those policy issues, um, using your voice through your vote too. Awesome. So that leads very perfectly uh, into our next question. Um, in more of a big picture regard, rather than individual actions, we could make large systematic changes, uh, taking into consideration equity and the environment, which both of you or all of you uh, highlighted. Um, there are opportunities for improvements in the food system that have been discussed for years. Um, what are some of your initial takeaways about how the pandemic could inform some of those food system policies and practices moving forward? I can kick it off from a restaurant perspective, um, really from the whole hospitality industry. I think we're going to see a lot of longstanding change. Um, so what I mean by that, maybe I'll give a not restaurant example. We're talking a lot about hotels and what that change is going to look like going forward. Um, maybe there's not food service. You know, maybe there's not a buffet when you stay at a hotel anymore because of COVID. Maybe there's not the mini bar in the um, in the room that you're used to, or the co little coffee machine and maker, all those touch points. So um, I think from a practical, what's going to change and how is it going to look different, um, the whole hospitality industry is really going to be adapting. And I think that some of those changes are going to be longstanding, um, even after hopefully um, soon COVID won't be such a concern. I think those changes will uh, remain. Yeah, this is this is Garrett. I mean, this is something we've um, talked a lot about is, you know, I talked about the increase in CSA sales, the increase in kind of like people flocking towards um, where can I, I buy food from a local farmer or from a local producer um, or, you know, different different options for, for, for accessing their food, um, you know, based off of fears of going to the grocery store or um, just a desire to support, you know, local producers at this time. Um, you know, we've been asking a lot of questions, okay, what does that look like once those fears may subside or how much does that impact next year's CSA sales? And um, we're really, we're really not, not sure right now. You know, it's kind of, um, we hope obviously that um, this will lead towards potentially more, you know, not be more of a permanent swing in that direction. Um, you know, I mean, local food has been trending and it's been, a, you know, it's been a popular thing to do. Um, for, for a long for a long time, but I feel like it also has so much has had so much opportunity for growth. Um, you know, we talked about the number of CSAs that actually have I think we have around 1500 CSA shares last year in the West, West Michigan Grand Rapids area. Um, when you look at the po overall population, that's such a tiny drop in the bucket. Um, and if we did say, you know, more people, I think we're going to probably see a lot of CSA farmers this year not be able to support the demand. Um, and I think we think that's a good thing for this year, um, but then how does that, does that demand drop off next year? What does that look like? Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot of interesting questions. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting questions on a federal level and a state level. Um, what does support for local farmers look like? Um, what do some of these federal programs that are supporting businesses right now, um, how are they rolled out and what do they look like? And how long-term um, will those impacts be? Um, I mean, we, we would definitely love to see um, a continued um, support and, and voices of, of local communities, um, especially communities of color. And Lisa can, I'm sure, can speak more to that. But I think this this pandemic has highlighted and has has obviously adversely impacted communities of color and has highlighted those disparities um, between you know health impacts, food access, um, food equity, um, and those are some of the things that that we're definitely hoping. Um, we see, uh, you know, highlighted moving forward, and really see some some strong policy change on all levels, local, local, state, and federal, um, towards towards understanding those things further, and understanding what are what are really the the um, institutional level impacts that that are kind of causing those disparities. Wow, that is a, a big question. I agree with um, Garrett. Um, we don't know. Um, we are hoping that um, um, that um, marginalized families that we work with uh, tap more into the local community and support local farmers, local um, farm stands, 
um, local um, restaurants. Um, we are encouraging that and we are um, sh um, hopefully doing a good, good job of showing where um, that support really does matter, uh, regardless of the fact if you're using um, food subsidy dollars to do that. Um, the, and, and I'm struggling with this because um, marginalized families um, are not um, tapped into resources like um, FarmLink, if I said that um, correctly, and um, um, some of those resources are too expensive for them. Um, but um, we are still trying to make sure that they are at least aware of the resource and if they're able to come together collectively to tap into that so that we are supporting local um, that is happening. Um, the uh, highlights that they're, they've been showing in the news, particularly um, with the numbers of um, African Americans, people of color dying from this virus, the reality of, uh, those of us who are on the ground, it's not new. It's just being highlighted. And uh, people are dying because they don't have um, health insurance. They don't have an equitable um, food system to, to tap into. That's not new news for us. That is existing. And it's going to get worse um, after this virus. And so um, to we are trying to figure out what our what are some of the strategies um, with the work that we are currently doing that we can add to, to um, help in those um, situations. But again, we do highlight support local restaurants. We do highlight, this is why we wanna support farms and we do highlight, this is why we support our local farm stands. We also highlight, this is why it may be better to have more of a vegetarian diet than a diet with meat in it. Um, um, we, we feel for the meat industry, but at the same time, it kind of helps us to highlight, um, this is why plant-based diet may be better because we can grow our own plants. We may not have a pig or a cow, but, um, we can grow us some, um, cabbage and some collard greens. And so in that sense, um, um, helping folks to understand that um, food does not mean meat at the top of the food chain, so to speak, what's on your plate, but um, understanding the balance around what is a healthy and nutritious diet um, and that it can taste good, um, we're having uh, those kind of conversations. But we are realis realistic in that the food system is not equitable and, um, the the virus has highlighted what already exists it is not new because of the virus and we're figuring out how we can bring about change fantastic thank you all of you um so some questions from our audience if anybody has any other questions um just add them to the chat or to the q and a um, but I'm going to bring some up that have already been put into the chat right now. Just a quick one. Um, Lisa, you may know the answer to this. Are the Southeast Farmers Market and the Chavez Farmers Market scheduled to open this summer or have there been any changes based on uncertainty? That one's a pretty, pretty good The question. Southeast um, Area Farmers Market is scheduled to um, open. We don't open until July. Um, I am not sure about the Chavez. I'm hoping that it does open. Um, we definitely need to have that market in place working with our uh, Latino population. Um, but I can say that the Southeast Area Farmers Market, um, in terms of um, working with our vendors, um, we will start that in July, but our bulk buying program, buying from Country Life. And there, there are several um, farmers markets, um, and maybe Garrett can speak to that, I don't know. Um, that also are tapped into a bulk buying program. But we are, if anyone is interested in bulk buying, um, the Southeast Area Farmers Market um, is doing that type of business now. Fantastic, and this, uh, this kind of goes nicely with, uh, this question kind of goes nicely with that. And um, between Garrett and Lisa, you may be able to answer this. Um, it was asked, are area growers doing outreach to neighborhoods where they typically don't have any connections and can low income households connect to the farmers in a reasonable manner um, for example, like a sliding scale CSA, 
Um, or are there other ways that neighbors can access supports to buy direct from farmers where they have limited funds? I don't okay. know of any uh, sliding scale CSAs in Michigan, but. I can jump in there. I know, I know there's a couple um, in the Ann Arbor area. Um, and there's a lot of examples of great programs out there where, um, you know, organizations have supported subsidized CSA sales for, um, for community members that may not be able to afford that upfront cost. Um, uh, again, the SNAP and Double Up, um, there's, there's issues around SNAP and Double Up and CSA sales, and that's kind of a policy example, I think, that um, something we're hoping to, to be able to continue to push for is, you know, allowing more flexibility in the way SNAP and Double Up, um, SNAP specifically, um, funds are, are allowed to be utilized. So right now you can't use them if, unless you're like actually getting the food um, at that time. So for the CSA model, the payment up front, that doesn't really work as well. Um, also, there are very limited options for using SNAP um, benefits to purchase online. And as we've seen, a lot of farmers go to online purchasing, um, pre-sale purchasing, even when they're at farmer's markets, they're encouraging their, their customers to pre-sale. So everything's already sold and pre-bagged. Um, and right now the, the, the USDA um, is, is, has been running a pilot for online SNAP benefits. Um, the, the organizations involved in that pilot include Walmart and Amazon, um, and then they're in a few states. So it kind of feels like the global industrial food system <laughs> is kind of like continuing to perpetuate those inequities and then also benefiting from them as they're kind of the ones that are connected to the USDA and have those resources. Um, but there's a lot of work being done right now to, to get in touch with the USDA and say, hey, like this is a need right now and you need, we, need, we need to be able to figure this out and have this work for, for small farmers and farmers markets as well. So um, yeah, I think um, you know, we've seen great organizations working here in West Michigan to support the connection of local growers with um, people that need food and those food resource outlets. Access of West Michigan is a good example. Um, I saw Wendy Randall was the one to answer that question. She's the leader in that space as well. So I um, appreciate the question. Um, um, I also say that the, the growers group, the West Michigan Growers Group is an organization that I work with that kind of is like a local network of local farmers. Um, we're looking at different models of um, getting food from local growers um, into different areas of the community, um, possibly some pop-up farmers markets, those sorts of things. Um, so uh, more info to come on that soon, hopefully. Excellent. Thank you, Garrett, for um, sharing that. Um, um, I can say some of the things that um, our kitchen table is trying to do on a small scale is we're actually trying to do delivery. So this will be our first time trying to do capture orders online, but also making sure, because a lot of people don't have computers, they don't have Wi-Fi, they have to use their phones. Um, and, but we found that more often than not, people are tech savvy when it comes to their phones. So there's all kinds of things that you can do with phones that I had no idea about. Um, and it's one of the ways that um, we're able to host um, our cooking demos through Facebook Live. You don't have to have um, equipment like a computer or iPad. You don't have to have Wi-Fi. You can tap in um, um, through that link. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to do this, but um, our goal is, and it will allow our food garden coaches and our cooking coaches to, um, that we're able to um, pay them um, a stipend of some sort where we can do deliveries that if we have some pre-orders. So we have talked to our vendors. We only have between seven to 11 vendors. So again, we're very, far, we're very small. Um, and because of that craziness with SNAP where you have to be there to pick up the food and all of that kind of stuff, um, we are figuring out where if we go deliver, be able to run SNAP because we do have an electronic system that we can use. We're hoping that we're able to um, provide that service in that way. Um, in terms of neighborhoods that we haven't tapped into, um, our kitchen table, um, if anyone calls us, we make it we try to do to the best of our ability to show up and support. So um, whether you are within the Southeast area or not, um, we've been to Caledonia, we've been to Comstock, we've been to Rockford where people are interested in growing. Um, we may show up looking like we're part of a hazmat team, but we will show up um, as well as using uh, a virtual access. We will help you 
grow your food as well as using the guide to replication. We um, will help you um, grow your own food if that is something that you're interested in. So just because you're not in the Southeast area doesn't mean that we are not a resource for you along with Garrett and Kate. Fantastic. All right, thank you so much um, to, to everybody who attended and for all of your questions. Um, and thank you to our panelists for their answers. Um, I did see that there were other questions uh, that were not answered, some of them regarding um, farmers markets. Um, on May 5th, we do have a webinar coming up talking about farm resiliency. Um, and on that, we will have a representative from the Michigan Farmers Market Association. Um, so that may be something interesting to tune into for you. Um, and if you, uh, if uh, I will, I'll, I'll send out um, some of these questions individually to some of the panelists that are directed individually at them. Um, but perhaps they'll let me share their contact information as well, um, or, or anybody who has any additional questions can email us at West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. Um, if you did find your talk valuable today, please consider becoming a WMSBF member or checking out our website for some upcoming webinars or other opportunities um, to get involved. Um, thank you so much for the amazing information that everybody gave. Um, it was, it's, it's good to know uh, what's going on and how we can support local foods, um, the food, local food system um, in conjunction with our employees and, and, uh, and local businesses. So thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day.